All right, everybody, welcome back to Maddie Moolah, a.k.a. Maddie Broke Boy, a.k.a. God knows whatever you want to call me. Today we're going to be talking about Rocket Lab, but before we jump into the Investor Day presentation, just encourage you guys to follow me on Twitter. It's where I spend the majority of my time updating people what I'm doing, trolling around with people, and jest, of course. I don't actually try to troll people, but um, I try to interact and have a lot of great conversations with a lot of great people um, on Twitter. So I encourage you guys, that's where I spend the majority of my day. Uh, I don't spend like all day on there, but it's where I do a lot of interactions and communicating replies with people. Uh, so it's probably the easiest way to get in touch with me as well if you're ever interested. But <clears throat> didn't have the opportunity to watch the video today, but I did have the opportunity after work today to look at the Investor Day presentation that Rocket Lab had came out with. And once again, I am extremely excited about this opportunity. So um, even before I looked at the Investor Day presentation, I continued to buy more shares today in my individual brokerage account. Not too many, but it was a probably 8% or 9% increase in my position overall. So pretty excited about that. Hopefully getting closer and closer to that inevitable $8 cost basis. I think I'm at like eight, like mid eights, something like that. So pretty good. I've had um, Rocket Labs since before it merged with the SPAC company. So pretty exciting to, to kind of say uh, I have, but I think that this is pretty cool. Like the investor presentation split in to five key parts, the overview of what they're really trying to do, the electron launch capabilities, the space systems, which before I even invested in Rocket Labs was not one of the things that I even really had on my radar. And it's been more so just recently with some of their acquisitions that this part has truly just been like mind blowing to how quickly they're getting up to speed with their acquisitions and how quickly it's gonna be a huge long-term revenue um, generator for them as a whole. Then they talked a little bit about Neutron, which they're making pretty good progress. And actually they mentioned something like a launch Complex number three, which I was pretty surprised about. I thought they were only going with the two. So I'm curious to see uh, if in this presentation they talk about the third. I looked for it. I couldn't see it. Maybe a third time through it would allow us to. And then fifth, the financials piece. So the uh, most important piece uh, of this is really the big piece of the, um, I guess, the business plan or like the direction of the company which has changed from what I remember when I first invested in it. I invested in it because I anticipated it was going to be <clears throat> a similar like company to SpaceX. And they've really differentiated themselves with this space systems, satellites and stuff of the like. They have some really good slides specifically talking about how many components of the companies that they've invested in are being launched into space as of 2021. Uh, and then how much they want to get to. Like they want to obviously have pretty much every product that is in a satellite um, have a rocket lab product in it so that way they have an opportunity to make money off of every satellite that they put into low earth orbit or into a galactic orbit or anything like that so pretty interesting and then they have the applications piece of it as well um so they've done a lot of interesting stuff 30 launches uh, from electron to date 150 satellites uh, 320 kilogram launch at the moment, which is bigger than Virgin Orbit, which I think Virgin Orbit, and I think a slide shows it's like 500 kilograms, something like that. Done a lot of strategic acquisitions, 1,300 team members. Um, so some really, really cool stuff um, that they've that kind of shown. And second most frequently launched U.S. rocket behind um, behind SpaceX, obviously. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there was a really good slide later on talking about the total addressable market exploding in the next five years and then continuing to grow, obviously, out to uh, to 2030, um, which is, is pretty crazy if you kind of think about it. Um, yeah, so I'll just I'll kind of leave it to once we get to that sort of slide. But this kind of just shows this slide specifically shows the amount of talent that they have across the entire infra, uh, sorry, the executive team from ULA, from Broadcom, SpaceX, NASA, GD, um, 
Jet Propulsion Labs, a lot of great companies. Solero is a really cool uh, piece within here that I think they acquired that I want to talk a bit about a little later on when it shows up, which I had no idea that they even had, but plays a huge piece if you think about it. Solar in space because you're not obviously connected to some sort of battery or anything like that, so it allows your satellites to continuous, have continuous power over time. But I love these slides that they always have with respect to all the different launches that they've had. I watched the September launch, I forget what it was called, but um, that was pretty cool. And I think their goal at the moment is to have a 15 day turnaround, which I think they had from August to September. And their goal overall <clears throat> is to have 24 launches a year. So one, or once every 15 or so days. So they're currently at about a once every month sort of cadence. So you can kind of see you know, they had one November, December, February, April. So they did miss March, May, June, July. So they're on a good cadence at the moment. Um, and what they're trying to get down to is really twice a month. And I think within here, it talks about what their maximum capability will be. So where's like the point at where they kind of hit an asymptote where they're not going to get any larger of launches than that. Um, but yes, since they've, uh, spec nine successful launches, um, hundred percent success rate launched missions to the moon, 320 kilograms, uh, that September launch was actually their first launch from pad B, which was pretty cool. And I think it was also the first launch, uh, utilizing reused parts from their recovered flight, which I think was pretty cool. I don't think it was the booster itself, but I think it might've been components of the engine that they did i thought this was awesome to kind of see um leader in small satellite launches so you have virgin orbit with four being the next largest after firefly still trying to get off the ground astra has had two launches to date so i thought that was pretty cool and i think that this speaks good words where they have an advertised lift capability in virgin orbit of 500 kilograms they've only really launched 61 kilograms Whereas, you know, at Rocket Lab, they've said, hey, we can do 320, we're launching 320. Um, so they're not trying to, to falsely advertise anybody here. <clears throat> uh, mentioned this a little bit earlier, they're trying to increase um, the launch cadence. So um, second quickest is 115 days. Uh, third is 164 days. They're at 15 days currently. And I think they're trying to get it down to like, once every other day or once every third day, if I remember correctly. Uh, yes, so here we have three launch pads, two countries at the moment, um, one being two launch pads in New Zealand, and they're currently working on launch complex number two in Virginia. 132 launch slots, launch slots annually. So I think that that's, I guess, one every three days, basically. Um, which I anticipate you might be able to get faster than that. But um, anyway, one every 132 days, or once, sorry, 132 in a year is still pretty impressive, but it's less than what, say, SpaceX is going after, which is one or two launches a day. So um, they did actually ship an Electron rocket to launch complex number two which I thought was pretty cool because it will be the first U.S. launch from soil for Rocket Lab. Um, and that's scheduled for December 2022, so I'm really looking forward to that. And then um, the backlog grew 37% since last year, August 2021. So that was pretty cool, specifically talking about NASA and their contracts to be able to go to the moon and capstone and stuff of the like there. And they've already started to sign deals at launch complex number two which is based out of virginia so um interesting this talks a little bit about the difference in say the sectors that they're going after and the customer base as a whole so returning customers is 72 so they're retaining decent amount of customers as well as continuing to grow and they're doing 20 percent civil 30 percent defense 50 percent commercial which i was pretty surprised about i thought it'd be a little bit more civil and defense so the fact that some of it, or half of them at the moment, is commercial was pretty interesting to me. 
and um, they do have additional launches. This is kind of showing the upcoming launches. They have one final launch with Black Sky, some NASA launches, um, Hawkeye. They're going to do the three launches um, with the, with the one that's also going to be done in December 2022 at Launch Complex Number Two. Um, so this is kind of cool to be able to see the uh, parachute system where they actually did capture a booster in the air. So I'm curious, um, yeah, at, at what point they actually use, reuse the recovered Rutherford engine. So I know they used some parts, I think, uh, but they didn't use the full engine again. But I did see the test that they did, and the test looked like it was perfectly fine. So, um, yes, all this is to try to increase margins. So being able to recover... Um, Reusability gives you 65% cost return uh, of that. So if you're able to reuse it, it reduces the second launch by 65%, which is pretty, pretty uh, significant and hugely going to be beneficial for margins going forward. Uh, and this is where I really got intrigued in this investor presentation, talking about the space systems, because it's kind of been showing up more and more. But one of the things that I didn't recognize was like this huge shift towards it being a consistent revenue stream, um, which it looks like it's going to be over 50% kind of going forward. Um, so I was pretty intrigued by this and it's really gave me even more bullishness in the organization where I just invested in it because I wanted to see rockets go into space. Um, and, you know, if I made money off of it, so be it. And now it's kind of like, well, you have this satellite as a service company that you're kind of getting for free that I had not really for free, but I had no idea about it. So having that opportunity to invest in a company like that is pretty awesome because I was not expecting it whatsoever. Um, so here's the four acquisitions that they've done. They've been Sinclair, Inter Interplanetary, ASI, PSC, and Solero. Um, I don't know if that's how you say Solero, Solero or not. Um, but really interesting um, acquisitions being that 38% of the launches that went into space had the one of these four companies involved in it. So a huge market share, um, 38%. Um, not to say it's all 38% of all launch components were, but um, they in featured technology coming from a company that is now owned wholly by Rocket Lab. Um, so yes, things like supplying hardware for the James Webb Telescope, uh, NASA OneWeb Constellation, um, the NASA Mars Ingenuity Helicopter, things like that. And they've just built out this Long Beach facility here, 10,000 square feet of um, clean room that they can build some of these satellites. Uh, places in this part goes probably a little bit over my head um, but they're looking for basically to provide the entire end-to-end -end solution from the rocket the engine the trajectory uh, the the satellites that they use within them as well and I think this touches a little bit about what they were doing in capstone um, and being able to get close to the moon to be able to support the future um, moon moon, moon missions are going to be happening in the next couple of years um <clears throat> so this allows uh, electron which is the small orbit rocket to kind of get what it needs for its ability to go to mars and venus which are also opportunities that rocket lab has going forward so it's a first stepping stone that's been successful um which is pretty cool and um it's going to help go to Venus and Mars. And I think Venus, I think this is going to be the first commercial opportunity to go to Venus. We're not going to land on it, but we're going to definitely fly by and, and get opportunities associated with that. And I don't think there's been much um, work done associated with it. So cool that Rocket Lab is on its way to kind of forging that future. Uh, let's see what else there was. Um, Yes, this talks a little bit about the um, 
space buses that they're going to have, spacecraft buses, $143 million contract. I thought well, that was pretty cool. But the solar panels from Solero, 2.7 kilowatts per satellite is necessary to kind of keep all these things online. And did we pass Solero's? Um, it's coming up. Okay, so here's where you actually have some of the key components going into these future missions. So Sinclair Interplanetary um, apparently creates reaction wheels. Not 100% what those things are, but um, Space Heritage 70 units in orbit. Reaction wheels over 200 units in orbit. Um, so they're going to be able to try to get 3,000 units per year capability established for um, constellations going forward. So great opportunity there. And then you have ASI, which is now owned wholly by Rocket Lab. Off-the-shelf flight software opening on 53 spacecrafts, cumulative of 160 years in space. Um, so that obviously is now owned wholly by Rocket Lab. Um, not so sure what PSC does, just like the other real two, but this one I thought was really intriguing. The solar aspect of how they could put these on structures and satellites to be able to power these things for the long term. So they acquired this in January 2022 and allows them to create a structure business for satellites and launch vehicles um, and basically have deployable solar array solutions. So why is this important? It's the single highest efficiency cell in the world at 33%. That's huge if you're in solar and you know anything about solar. A few years ago, I was doing some research and like first solar that was making commercial solar cells was looking for like, they were striving for 20%. Um, so to see that we're now getting close to 33% uh, is astonishing that uh, these things will be used by the NASA Mars helicopter, the Maxar missions, um, huge. Apparently 40% lighter than the competing solar cells. That's pretty cool because every, uh, every pound matters, right? It's only 320 kilograms of lift that you have on the electron. If it's half the weight, that's gonna be huge. Um, so it really helps with respect to that. Um, satellite radios yeah so pretty cool and this was awesome 66% of Rocket Labs total Q2 earnings was from space systems so you think about the opportunity where it provides steady cash flow rather than the lumpiness of launch revenue it's pretty badass so they currently also have about 400 million dollars of space system backlog so pretty pretty interesting to kind of see um, going forward and then this was really fun looking I, I was like super confused as to why there's a turkey so I don't know if it's like something associated with Thanksgiving next year like I'm so confused but um, I was pretty excited to see the molds coming for the neutron rocket which is a much larger rocket a medium-sized rocket and you can see this large 3d printer coming ahead with these and talking specifically about what's reusable, what's not reusable, the mission profiles being low Earth orbit all the way to interplanetary, um, just really cool stuff, specifically talking about where they've gotten to thus far. And um, they also mentioned they don't have a capsule at the moment, but they're potentially looking into it, which I think is pretty interesting because um, I know SpaceX is currently going after that um, market, so cool to see. But just goes to show you a little bit about uh, everything that's kind of going on and uh, basically everything that's just ramping up to be this awesome company that's only a few years behind SpaceX, in my opinion. Um, granted, they don't have the automated, or um, the launching reusability yet, but that's to come. And here's a picture of what they think the Virginia launch pad might look like. I thought it was pretty interesting that this is kind of like out in the ocean and I'm like, where's the road to kind of get this rocket out there? Um, so I don't know if it's supposed to ride like these tracks. Like I was very kind of confused about that. Um, or if the launch is happening from over here and this is just where it lands. So um, 
curious to see what continues to happen with that. But continued developments with the U.S. government. So they have 24 million contract with Space Force that had that. And then, um, yeah, so talking specifically a little bit about some of the milestones that are upcoming. Construction underway at Launch Complex 3. I was confused. Where is Launch Complex 3? Is this supposed to be Launch Complex 2? Because Launch Complex 1 is in New Zealand. Launch Complex 2 is in Virginia. So I'm like, is this a top secret launch complex or am I just dense and not up on the times? But you have all these different milestones that are going to happen for Neutron coming at the end of 2023. So we're literally like almost 12 months away from the first Neutron rocket flying. So that's pretty cool to, to take a look at. Um, and they just talk a little bit about what they've done throughout this presentation. But this is kind of where I wanted to get to in terms of the expansion of addressable market for um, Rocket Lab as a whole. So you can kind of see these are the markets that they're kind of getting into with them having the ability to kind of capture 90 million or 90 billion, sorry, uh, in, in the 2030-ish time frame. So that was pretty, pretty interesting to see. First half of 2022 launch revenue is 26 million. The space system is 70 million. So pretty substantial. It's about 70% of the revenue in first half of 2022 coming from space systems. And you can see we'll likely get an additional 23 million in um, launch revenue in Q3 and 38 million from space systems. So you can continue to see even from first half of 22 to 3Q, you're seeing a growth, right? Because half of 70 is 35. You're going to 38. So that consistent revenue stream is really coming in where you're going from 23 million in all of 2021 alone to likely to go over 120, 130 million from space system revenue as a whole. And 39 million of launch revenue. And it looks like you're gonna go over um, just under 50 million um, in launch revenue and that's without including the fourth quarter. So really cool to see um, overall. And this is kind of says that revenue generating customers increased from 29 to 87 or 3x uh, year to date versus 2020. So they've had three times the amount of customers, which is pretty cool to be able to see. And then this is over time where their margins have kind of gotten to. Cost of goods sold, obviously without using reusing rockets it's gonna cost more than it takes to to basically get um so you're basically creating log rockets at a loss but first half of 2022 they're getting things to the point where it's at least somewhat profitable research and development's actually making some money the g selling gna is actually doing okay and then actually getting the rockets in the air and the space systems uh, increases with that but long term they're trying to get cost of goods sold down to 50 percent so if you look back at what the forecasted revenues might be for the company, which could be a couple hundred million dollars in not too far future, knowing that, you know, we're, we're already at a hundred million basically for the first half of 2022. And we're looking at about a 50 to 60 million run rate um, quarterly thereafter, potentially, then, you know, you're looking at, you know, close to 250 million kind of going into 2023 um or maybe even larger closer to 300 million and if you're able to get those revenues down or the cost of goods sold from the revenues down to 50 percent of revenues then you're going to be sitting pretty happy um but yeah i thought this one was really cool to see as well solera from a minus uh from approximately 10 percent gross margin to 30 percent gross margin by 2024 and that's that really thin 33 percent effective rate Burn down of $150 million legacy backlog at time of acquisition. Um, so that they bought $150 million worth of revenue basically with this acquisition. So really cool to see um, that some of these businesses are already doing extremely well. Um, and the hope is, is they still have about $550 million in cash on hand as of June. So end of one, you know, the first half, really. They raised $770 million basically from the SPAC. Uh, they purchased a hundred and some million dollars worth of these companies uh, over the past however long. 
and uh, yeah, they still have the 546 million uh, in cash. So really cool to see, man. And I was just like really excited to come in and, and watch it, um, or I guess look at the investor presentation, uh, buy more shares, try to get closer to two to three thousand shares in total. I think I'm close to twenty hundred shares, two thousand shares, basically. So strategically over time, if I'm able to, um, I don't think it'll take too much to make this thing move in the right direction. Uh, it's a long-term hold for me. Um, I don't necessarily think it's going to be like moon one day, uh, but I think it could move pretty significantly in the order of 30 to 40% over the course of the week very easily uh, because it has a, a pretty small flow and it also just, I think a lot of people are probably going to short cover um, whether that's puts that they had open or whatever, but it's going to drive a, a run up in the price very quickly um, as we've seen in the past with this particular organization. So uh, to me, this is the long-term hold as well. I think it's something that is continuing to see great progress and um, no plans on selling for me. Um, so really looking forward to continue to add to this position and this continues to, to show promise with respect to uh, with respect to where I purchased into the company for um, continuing to see great promise with respect to that. So anyway, I'm going to upload this one and if I can find that Q&A piece of this investor presentation, I'll probably take a quick look and, and write some comments on it or whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, hope you guys find this video useful and I'll talk to you soon. Cheers.